Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Julia Chen. I'm the Activities Director at the Yale Club, and I'm very excited to welcome you all to our virtual lecture series, where we bring in a live speaker to do a talk and a Q&A that you can participate in from the comfort of your homes. Today, we are excited to welcome Dr. Deborah Dorsha. Dr. De Dr. Dorsha is a historian of medicine, mental health, and childhood. She received her PhD in history from Yale University and her MD from Harvard Medical School. Her work has been recognized with multiple awards, including the Richard C. Cabot Prize in the History of Medicine from Harvard Medical School, the Edwin W. Small Prize for Outstanding Work in American History from Yale University, the Jack D. Pressman Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Development Award from the American Association of the History of Medicine, and most recently, the Harris Fellowship in Medical Humanities at the Sydney Social Sciences and Humanities Advanced Research Center at the University of Sydney. Her work has been published in the Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences, the Bulletin of the History of Medicine and Pediatrics. And she has also written in the Philadelphia Inquirer and has been interviewed by Slate on her historical work. A practicing medical oncologist, Dr. Dorsha is the Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where she is a member of the Early Phase Trial Unit and the Center for Thoracic Oncology. She is also Adjunct Assistant Professor of the History of Medicine at Yale University, and she was a fellow for Davenport College. Her recent book, Emotionally Disturbed, is the first work to examine not only the history of residential treatment, but also the history of seriously mentally ill children in the United States. Today, Dr. Dorsha joins us to speak on the topic of From Delinquent to Disturbed and Back Again, African-American Children and the Crisis in Child Mental Health. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Dorsha. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for joining me on Wednesday at 6.30. Um, I will warn you, because I am an odd duck and I am both a historian of, of medicine and uh, specifically of child mental health and a practicing adult oncologist, I hope I won't, but I could get an emergency call during this. I'm crossing my fingers that all will go well. I think I left the service under control. So I'm gonna put my historical hat on. I'm really excited to share with you my work today. Yale has been tremendously supportive of my career. Um, I may or may not have gone to the other place for college, but um, really I, I have actually spent most of the last 12 years at Yale where I uh, not only did my PhD, but also did my residency and, and advanced training in oncology and uh, all I can say is that, uh, and I met my husband in the same PhD program, we miss New Haven a lot. So today I'm going to share with you just a fraction of the work that really went into my book. Um, it was published last year by the University of Chicago Press. I make absolutely no money on it. So if you're interested in learning more about what I talked about, it's available wherever you like to buy books. Um, but I thought we'd just talk about one specific aspect of the book. And what I'd like to do, I really look forward to questions at the end. But if you do have questions or thoughts while I'm going, I'm not thrown at all by you letting me know what those are. Please type them in the, in, the, in the Q and A and I can actually address some of those things as I go. So that's fine as well. Um, and I, what I don't wanna do is take up the entire time with just you listening to my dulcet tones. I wanna make sure that uh, we can really have a conversation about what I think is a, an interesting issue. So I'm gonna share my screen. And thank you so much, Julia, for the invitation. I'm gonna start by telling you the story of a boy. Standing in front of a juvenile judge for stealing and skipping school in 1949, 11-year-old Claude Brown assumed that, like his friends, he was probably going to be sent upstate to Warwick, otherwise known as the New York Training School for Boys, when he instead arrived at the similarly named Wiltwick. Let's see if we can advance. There we go. The similarly named Wiltwick, 60 miles north near Poughkeepsie, he was distraught. He spent a long night lying in the dark, plotting his escape. But things looked different in the light. Walking out of school the next day, he saw boys sledding down a hill and, quote, having a whole lot of fun. Um, the African-American novelist and essayist remembered later in his memoir, Manchild in the Promised Land. He joined in the sweat sledding, and over the next days and months, he quickly made friends at Wiltwick, which he noted was different from the other places he had been in. Six months after his arrival, a psychologist named Ernst Paponik arrived to run the school, and he really changed how things ran. He outlawed corporal punishment and really 
changed his focus to psychological rehabilitation. Claude Brown thrived at Wiltwick, and he found that he deeply respected Poponik, who listened without judgment and who always seemed to tell the truth. And although I'm going to talk more in detail about what places like Wiltwick were all about, I want to point out some of the images you're looking at right now. On the upper left uh, is another a boy who was at Wiltwick, and you can see all the children in the background. There are a lot of smiles, okay? Down on the lower left, a young boy playing with a dog at Wiltwick, featured in Life magazine in 1948. And then a story about the place in Reader's Digest showing a, a kid playing, uh, playing baseball. Um, on the other hand, I can't really tell if the slightly less uh, visible photo, uh, visible drawing is kids wrestling or one kid actually attacking each other, and it could go either way. Um, but I want you to remember these images as we look to the next set of images. Going home was a lot more difficult for Claude Brown. He felt like he no longer knew the Harlem that he had grown up in, and he spent his afternoons at Wiltwick's Harlem office with Dr. Poponik. When Brown once again became involved in a neighborhood gang, he was seen before again uh, by the juvenile court. He figured he'd go back to Wiltwick, a place that he loved, a place that he felt very comfortable at. But Wiltwick had no room. So he was finally sent to Warwick, a training school with steel bars on its windows that he called, quote, a jail in disguise. Boys had to have a pass just to walk around the campus. Quote, to someone passing by, he remembered, Warwick looked just like a boys camp, but everyone was under guard all the time and everybody had a job to do. Work gangs were a lot like chain gangs, minus the chains. A 1957 study of Warwick found the institution overcrowded, uneven in its meeting of discipline, even for minor infractions, and able to provide only, quote, limited or token clinical services to help the delinquent boys at house. So just compare these photographs to the ones I just showed you. Now, some of the photos of Wiltwick were from later years, from the 1950s, but you'll notice here that these photos of Warwick show boys essentially doing hard farm work. Um, you have them on tractors on the right and then uh, actually going through the fields on the lower left. Very different from what we saw before, uh, playing with the dog, playing baseball. So Claude Brown's starkly different experiences at Wiltwick and Warwick really illustrate the diverse landscape of options for delinquent children in mid 20th century America. So what did delinquent or juvenile delinquency even mean? Because the name of the meaning of that term actually changed over time. At the time, juvenile delinquency fundamentally meant illegal activity committed by a minor. But the truth was a bit more complicated. It might connote violent crimes, smaller infractions like burglary, or even status offenses like truanting or running away, which were only illegal because the offender in question was under 18. Meanwhile, the mental hygiene movement in the early 20th century was reframing delinquency as not just criminal behavior, but actually sort of an acting out behavior, reflective uh, of a deeper psychological problem. And places like Wiltwick, the more progressive centers, uh, which called themselves Residential Treatment Centers, or RTCs, reimagined the most troubled delinquent children as emotionally disturbed instead, and gave them a place to go altogether unlike the reform or training schools they were used to. Now, I do want to point out that although my book is about these centers, and I think what they did is really interesting, they were by no means perfect, but they were very different from the alternative, and, and that's something that I want to highlight today. Unfortunately, though children of color like Claude Brown were rarely the beneficiaries of going to these RTCs. When a federal report declared in 1969 that one million emotionally disturbed American children, the majority of whom were children of color, were going untreated, the existing child welfare infrastructure could not handle the additional weight. As a result, African American and other minority children really got the short end of the stick relegated to separate classrooms and schools in the best cases and to the juvenile justice system in the worst. So today, um, I'll chart how these children went from delinquent to disturbed and back again, and how despite a glimmer of hope in the mid 20th century, 
troubled, delinquent, or mentally ill Black children today are most likely to receive their care or lack thereof in the criminal justice system. So how did we get there? In the early 20th century, children labeled delinquent had been sent to reform schools or houses of refuge, which were punitive institutions which hoped to instill in their inmates middle-class white moral values by demanding hard physical labor. Uh, sorry, I think I'm missing a slide, but that's okay. This approach changed somewhat um, when juvenile courts were introduced. So juvenile courts have not always been around, um, but in the 1910s, they emerged starting in Chicago and then in Boston and many other large cities as part of the progressive movement um, and part of this community-based mental hygiene movement, which really sought to rehabilitate children to prevent them from getting severe mental illness as adults. Um, and so their real focus was on preventive management if possible. So these unusual courts were really thought of as rehabilitative agencies with judges who de redefined delinquency as a representation of psychological and socioeconomic stressors. And although on the, on the left you can see a group of children awaiting a verdict from a juvenile judge, Typically, a juvenile court looked very little like uh, a courtroom you might imagine today. It would often just consist of the child, uh, perhaps his or her parents, if available, and a judge. There was no jury, um, and they really, it was initially conceived as an opportunity for the judge to impart guidance or, uh, you know, advice onto the child and to help the child, uh, you know, so that he or she did not commit further, um, further crimes. Um, and so, on the other hand, this really very positive outlook um, was really sort of overrepresented. In many cases, unfortunately, these courts actually became mere detention centers or distribution centers for unwanted children. But in, in many ways, these courts, when they worked, signified a really important shift in the way that delinquency was understood. Um, really, again, as a symptom of a psychological problem rather than just uh, illegal behavior. Um, meanwhile, a related but separate movement called the Child Guidance Movement, again focused on addressing abnormal children, quote unquote abnormal children, in their communities. Um, and these centers started again in the 19 teens, really started growing in the 1920s, and had really hit their stride in the post-war era. I actually found out that my grandmother, who uh, was a child psychiatrist, worked at one of these centers. Um, and they were very community-based. Um, they saw children who were often referred by their parents or from school because they might be talking back, uh, staying out late at night, truanting from school. And so these centers were really intended to treat children who were deemed troublesome or what they actually deemed pre-delinquent to try to prevent problems from getting worse. And so these mental hygiene efforts had, you know, were really um, progressive for their time, but had many unanticipated consequences. A lot of children were too troubled to be treated in an outpatient child, clinic, child guidance clinic. And these clinics, again, were really only equipped to handle children who were perceived of as troublesome or uh, not severely ill. Okay, but, uh, but what, did, what happened to children who were, who were too sick to be treated at these centers, but were simultaneously being identified by mental hygiene efforts uh, as in need of some sort of psychiatric or mental health care? Well, they had really few places to go. Um, a very, very small number of children could be treated at large state mental institutions. Um, this was very, very rare. These were primarily institutions for adults. Many more of them, especially teenagers, were sent to punitive custodial training schools like Warwick, the one I, I presented earlier. Um, and there were a number of, uh, of trends at the time which actually helped uh, children stay at home um, if they were troubled or if uh, they might otherwise have found their way to, say, an orphanage. So in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, children without quote unquote, stable home lives, a very judgmental concept um, that meant that maybe they had parents who were not alive or maybe they had parents who were alive but unable to take care of them due to alcoholism, poverty, or a number of other reasons might be sent to live in an orphanage. 
these kinds of larger institutions were really falling out of favor in the early 20th century, um, especially because increasingly there were welfare funds to support those families. Adoption and foster care grew rapidly in the early 20th century as other ways of taking care of children without a steady home situation. So these institutions that were these large congregate institutions like uh, orphanages were really falling out of favor and were, were seen as very backward. So at the same time, we're identifying more troubled children in the community because we're trying to prevent trouble in the future. We don't really have anywhere for severely troubled children to go. And the institutions that had previously been housing lots and lots of children were shutting down as there were many other ways of taking care of children without stable home situations. So as a group, uh, as a result of all of these interacting forces, there was a group of sort of leftover children who couldn't be cared for in their communities. Um, and they emerged as a population in need of intensive inpatient treatment. And it was really, and I wanna point out here on the right, this is actually uh, a scene from um, one of the very first child guidance centers, Judge Baker, which still operates in Boston to this day. Um, and uh, really showing some of the one-on-one -on -one help a child is getting here. So it was in this complex context, uh, context that residential treatment centers, or RTCs, emerged. Most of these centers arose from the ashes of other, uh, sorry, of other institutions like orphanages, schools for so-called feeble-minded children who we might call intellectually disabled today, um, and training schools for delinquent children. And these RTCs were typically very small. Some of them had fewer than 20 children. Some of them had a few hundred, but generally fewer, only a few dozen. They were very therapeutically oriented and they used a psychiatric model to understand and treat a new type of child that they identified as quote unquote, emotionally disturbed. Many of these children like Claude Brown might've been labeled delinquent by teachers, staff members at child guidance clinics, juvenile judges or parents. Um, and so what actually happened at these residential treatment centers? And then I'll talk about what you're seeing in front of you. So residential treatment itself actually had three main elements. The first one was individual psychotherapy with the child, typically done with a psychiatrist, casework interviews with his or her parents. Casework interviews is a very, uh, historical term that we don't use today, but basically social workers would meet intensively with parents to talk about their children, how to handle them behaviorally, their own uh, troubled pasts and so on. Um, and, and you can imagine that it was a lot easier to get parents in who had means uh, and a, a means of transportation who could actually come to these centers and spend the time to work with, uh, with the social workers. And the last part of residential treatment was called milieu therapy. What did that mean? And that latter idea really referred to the idea that every element of the child's environment had therapeutic meaning. And they really meant everything from the food the child ate to the clothes he or she wore, the games he or she played with the other children. Um, it was really about making every moment matter and making the entire environment of this RTC therapeutic. And so although these centers varied significantly in size and focus, again, some were wards that were part of large mental hospitals, some were in houses, some were connected to outpatient child guidance clinics. So these were very heterogeneous organizations. The people who worked there identified one another as being involved in the same pioneering project, the treatment of children who had been designated incorrigible. And these people who used the same language, who attended the same conferences, who visited one another's centers to learn more about them, they hoped that their centers would provide progressive therapeutic settings for children who might otherwise have been sent to punitive or custodial institutions. Um, and this is really the topic of my book, so I can't get into all of it today, but I think these three pictures are really, uh, really representative in some ways. So um, in Topeka, the very famous Menninger Clinic, which was sort of the epicenter of 20th century psychiatry, had a children's center. Um, and this is a photograph, um, it's actually a posed photograph uh, of a, a 
staff uh, member's child for a magazine illustrating uh, play therapy. And so really in this situation, the psychiatrist would get down on the floor and play with the child. And it was about really trying to understand the child and play at their level. And again, establishing this therapeutic rapport. These centers were often on beautiful large grounds. Bradley Hospital, which still exists in Providence, is part of the lifespan health system, um, was on an enormous estate grounds and there were a lot of outdoor activities. Again, this is not children doing you know, farm work or uh, being in sort of these work gangs. This was trying to help children enjoy themselves and to, and to fix some of the emotional problems they had, or so they saw it. And interestingly, uh, the National Institutes of Health had its own residential treatment center on campus. And this is, an, uh, this is a photograph um, showing the head of the uh, center, Fritz Radel, uh, a prominent psychoanalyst, um, with the children sitting on the floor having a singing hour. So I hope you're getting a sense that this is a very different flavor of place than some of these uh, more punitive centers. So let's talk about some of the reasons that though these centers were not perfect, because they certainly weren't. In theory, most of these centers stated that they were open to treating children of all racial and ethnic backgrounds. And despite their race-blind race technical admissions policies, I found that few of them actually treated African-American children. In Topeka, the Children's Division of the Menninger Clinic, which is the site of the photograph on the left, um, had welcomed children of all races since the 1930s, according to their written criteria. But by 1956, they had never actually had a Black child in residence. At the Children's Service Center of Wyoming Valley in Pennsylvania, African-American children were theoretically welcomed, but as of 1951, they told a larger group of philanthropic and social work uh, researchers that they had never accepted a Black child, quote, because it is thought they would not be able to adjust in the school and community, end quote. A 1960 study of 21 of these centers found that 85% of children in residential treatment were white, 13% were black, and the re remaining 2% were Puerto Rican, American, Indian, Asian, and multiracial. Those are categories that those researchers use, not my own. So a few RTCs did serve large numbers of African American children. And I wanna take a brief aside here to say, the only times that you're actually seeing faces of children are things that were published in magazines or in large publications by the schools. So otherwise I've uh, blurred out the children's faces. This is actually at the children's unit of Bellevue Hospital in New York City. And you might say, what do you mean they had a center? That's a hospital, that's not a house. I don't see any grounds. Bellevue was actually one of the first residential treatment centers, and there were a, a small number of these centers that were actually just wards on hospitals, but again, they adopted the same principles they shared in research and learning and used the same language as their, uh, as their counterparts at other more sort of residential house-like settings. Um, so at the children's unit in Bellevue Hospital, about one third of the children treated there were African American. And so here you can see a variety of photos depicting children at Bellevue in the 1930s. And you can really see that this is a racially diverse group. A couple things I just wanna mention about, um, you know, about, about these photos. First of all, really the joy of discovery in the archives. Um, I went to Brooklyn College uh, just expecting to really find very little um, in the archives of this psychiatrist and opened up a folder and dozens of these priceless photographs uh, came, you know, fell out. And I, there's something about finding these photographs that really just depicts what happened in a way that you can never really capture just by reading text. And so on the left, there are two twins with their dolls. Uh, in the middle, a residential worker, a nurse who took care of children. Um, you see the large uh, fence around, they had sort of a makeshift yard on the roof of the hospital. On the upper right, um, wearing matching robes and participating in a snowball fight, or that's what the inscription, the inscription often gave really interesting clues as to what was going on. And then the bottom right, just a, a group of children playing together. So Wiltwick, remember the place that Claude Brown liked to go, actually specifically courted children from minority racial and ethnic backgrounds and was really the other notable example of a residential treatment center that sought to treat minority children. It was founded in 1937 
Um, and it actually started off as a summer camp. It was transformed over the next 20 years from a custodial or punitive institution into this more progressive residential center for emotionally disturbed boys. In, and I, I want to point out this uh, fundraising brochure in 1966, um, again, really focusing not only on the children playing, but on the interracial nature of their relationship. And I want to share with you how their mission statement uh, was updated. So they really tried to reflect the change from going from this custodial institution to a more rehabilitative, psychiatrically oriented place. And so this earlier statement had noted that Wiltwick treated, quote, neglected, abandoned, destitute, delinquent, and pre-delinquent children without discrimination as to race or color. So you can see from right away, they were focused on um, a, a multi-ethnic, multi-racial population. Um, but the revised draft in 1955 said the population was dependent, neglected, abandoned, destitute, delinquent, and emotionally disturbed children. And I'm sorry the quote went off the slide here, but they still said without discrimination as to race or color. So the big difference here was that they took out delinquent and pre-delinquent and changed it to de delinquent and emotionally disturbed. And that phrase, emotionally disturbed, was actually invented by the same people who founded these progressive centers. So discussing and creating this group of leftover severely troubled children went hand in hand with the creation of these progressive centers. The school grew quickly under the aegis of its all-star board of directors. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt perhaps being the most famous of them. She visited frequently. The boys knew her well. She liked to come and, and do all kinds of activities with them. A multitude of liberal supporters from the NAACP um, and the American Jewish Congress. Um, the school counted African American celebrities like Harry Belafonte and Floyd Patterson as prominent supporters. And they held very high profile benefits at Lincoln Center. The archives of these of this center is available are, are available at the Columbia University. Uh, archives and full of glossy programs um, advertising musical and theatrical events to support Wiltwick at Lincoln Center, which is really notable when you think about the fact that this was a center for quote unquote delinquent uh, boys, mostly who most of whom were not white. So really a remarkable amount of celebrity attention to this place. Glossy fundraising pamphlets like this really emphasized the center's identity as one of the few residential treatment centers that served a multiracial population. Uh, the 1966 fundraising pamphlet, uh, The Wiltwick Story, featured photograph after photograph of African American and white boys playing on swings together, standing with their arms around each other, as you can see on the left, huddled around Eleanor Roosevelt to hear her read a book and playing the drums together. Three years later, though, the 1969 final report of the Joint Commission of the Mental Health of Children dropped a bomb on the child welfare community when it announced that only a third of the children who need care get it. Nearly one million receive no care at all. Newspapers ran immediate headlines about this newfound so-called crisis. They called it a children's tragedy. You can see here a crisis in mental health. These are from the front page of the New York Times, the Post, the LA Times, the Arizona Republic, and the Boston Globe. And I could have put 20 more uh, here, but it was really perceived as a sudden discovery of a crisis. So the commission's million dollar study, which is of course a lot more money considered in today's dollars, um, had been conducted between 1966 and 1969. It had been appointed by Congress, it had been funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, and had been funded because a number of child welfare organizations demanded increased attention to children's mental health needs. And you'll notice that I'm starting to use the term mental health, which really was not a term applied to children or really even used very much in this setting until really the 1960s and 1970s. So sometimes even terms that we take for granted are actually very historically specific and have not always been words that we use to describe different kinds of people. Um, and so the final product was called Crisis in Child Mental Health, and it really provided a damning critique of the state of children's mental health in the United States. 
Although the commission estimated that 1.4 million children under 18 needed some kind of psychiatric care, it reported that almost 1 million of those children did not get any care at all. According to the commission, there was an enormous number of previously unrecognized, emotionally disturbed children in the US who were ill enough to require some psychiatric care. But resources needed to treat all of these children properly, as the report noticed, just didn't exist. Instead, the report noticed that many children ended up warehoused in large state institutions for the adult mentally ill, while others slipped through the cracks, quote, bounced around from training schools to reformatories to jails and whipped through all kinds of understaffed welfare agencies, end quote. But these disturbed children, these million children, had not just materialized out of thin air. Two major factors contributed to the identification of so many previously unrecognized disturbed children. First, the Warren Commission, tasked with investigating the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, found in its 1964 final report that Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, had actually been an emotionally disturbed child. And I think this is sort of part of the Warren Commission that people have not really talked about very much. Not only had he been an emotionally disturbed child, he had been briefly sent to a detention home and then later rejected by two residential treatment centers because they didn't have any space to take him. So mental health experts and journalists seized on this story. It was really all over the headlines. And they did so as a means of fomenting fear about what they perceived as an epidemic of childhood mental illness sweeping the nation. One psychiatrist even declared that, quote, the world is full of potential Oswalds. While another warned readers that, quote, it is impossible to estimate how many boys like Lee Oswald are still being shoved through their classroom mirrors, never receiving the attention which could avert future tra tragedies. Um, so again, this was obviously a national tragedy and extensive uh, investigation to the roots of that tra tragedy had gone all the way back to Oswald's uh, you know, childhood behavior. They interviewed his neighbors, they spoke to his teachers, and they really presented this as a problem that could have been solved if there had been enough resources for him. Um, and how many more children like were there, uh, like Lee Harvey Oswald out there. The second factor that contributed to this declaration that there were thousands or millions of untreated, disturbed children in America was this new visibility of troubled children from minority backgrounds. Early in its work, the Joint Commission had assembled a separate multi-ethnic committee on children of minority groups after members had, quote, recognized that the mental health problems of minority children were severe enough to warrant special consideration. The committee concluded that poverty and racism, which were tightly linked, I know this sounds obvious to us now, but again, this is the 60s and this was a, a very important moment where, uh, where poverty and racism were linked, not just in this report, but more broadly in the social sciences and in politics, um, that poverty and racism were really to blame for these higher rates of emotionally disturbed children in minority populations. So the report concluded that poverty had resulted in unstable families, poor education and an unhealthy environment. And the report similarly deemed that racism contributed to emotionally disturbed children because those children had learned from an early age that society considered them to be inferior and that had resulted in widespread demoralization. Again, I'm not uh, confirming, I'm, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with what they said, just presenting their, their arguments. And so at this point, the psychologically damaging effects of poverty and racism were well-worn concepts in both politics and social science. But in focusing on these structural issues as the cause of poor mental health among minority children, the committee explicitly rejected the popular theory that a quote, culture of poverty among pathological black families had actually contributed to high rates of disturbance in that population. And that theory, which was actually very popular in part uh, and the key component of Daniel Moynihan's report um, uh, was something that they actually broke from and called quote, a residue of a racist society. But despite the clarion call to care for this swelling population of emotionally disturbed minority children, residential treatment was not a realistic solution to this perceived epidemic. And let me tell you why. 
So even though there were more than seven times as many residential treatment centers in 1965 compared to how many there had been in 1952, the Joint Commission calculated that only 8,000 of 1.4 million seriously ill children under 18, or 0.005%, were actually being treated in RTCs. Residential treatment was also way too expensive to treat all of these children. The Joint Commission estimated that one year of residential treatment and a child might be in one of these centers for six months to two years, considered a very short amount of time in that, in that time, that one year of this treatment cost between ten dollars and $18,000, or approximately $126,000 today. Moreover, it was really becoming undesirable to place children in institutions because in the 1960s and 1970s, there was generally quite, uh, quite virulent anti-institutional sentiment and moreover, em really an emphasis and, great and growing enthusiasm for caring for people in their own community. Residential treatment centers had played a major role in redefining delinquency as emotional disturbance but they were incapable of helping the largest population of children in need. So as these centers struggle to stay afloat amidst increasing criticism and rising costs, children of color were largely really excluded from this progressive approach to deviant behavior. In a related development, special education legislation in the 1960s and 1970s specifically listed emotionally disturbed children as deserving of its protections and actually reimagined emotional disturbance as disability. While I don't have time to talk about this in great detail today, and I'm happier to, happy to address it in the questions, troubled white children benefited from the push toward mainstreaming children with disabilities and were increasingly able to stay at home and go to community schools, while African-American children deemed deviant or delinquent were systematically sent to separate schools, separate classrooms, focusing on disabled children. And this pattern unfortunately persists today as Rachel Aviv showed in a beautiful New Yorker article about a, two years ago about disabled black children in Georgia. So while some emotionally disturbed children were being remade as disabled and were staying at home and going to community schools in regular classrooms, many others, particularly children from non-white backgrounds, were still placed in the custody of the juvenile justice system. Large state-run training schools hadn't gone anywhere, and they remained a very popular option um, for many delinquent African-American children and teenagers who were referred there by juvenile courts and welfare agencies. One clinical director of a reform school told the Christian Science Monitor in 1969 that, quote, we have the most disturbed children in the juvenile correctional system. And I find that quote really striking. Again, this is the head of one of these punitive training schools, really remarking that he has the most psychiatrically troubled children um, in the entire correctional system. So simply put, a schism had developed in how child welfare professionals and Americans more broadly understood juvenile delinquency. Was it merely crime committed by fundamentally bad children? Or was it a symptom of deeper emotional distress enacted by youngsters with undeveloped frontal lobes? Should it be treated punitively? Or should children be rehabilitated according to a medical, a psychiatric model? And just as they had in the early 20th century, courts and children's rights activists struggled with these questions. Supreme Court cases like Kent v. United States and Henry Galt guaranteed children due process, just like adults but they also repudiated the rehabilitative basis on which juvenile courts had been founded and embraced a criminal justice approach to children who broke the law. Children's rights advocates and journalists pointed to unacceptable conditions in institutions, schools, and courts, uncovering inhumane practices like prolonged isolation and physical and emotional abuse. At the Shirley Industrial School in Massachusetts, uh, Jerome Miller, who was the Department of Youth Services Commissioner, found that children were beaten if they spoke at all, that, quote, strip cells were used, and no program existed, except perhaps scrubbing floors in unison with brushes, end quote. In what was later called the Massachusetts Experiment, Miller actually, against a lot of opposition, shut down the entire state-run training school system in the space of two years after discovering that these inhumane uh, conditions pervaded the system. And although they remained relatively small in size and few in number, 
RTCs still existed. And in fact, they continued to grow, but, but again, were very small institutions. And they did serve a growing number of minority children and those from less affluent backgrounds. Still though, troubled or quote unquote delinquent black and other minority children were much more likely to be relegated to the punitive juvenile justice system. Today, the criminal justice system is the largest mental health provider in the country and disproportionately represents children from minority backgrounds. At the recently shuttered Connecticut, Connecticut Juvenile Training School, uh, which was about half an hour up the road from me for many years, um, and is, is actually located in Middletown for, for our Yaleys here, 79% um, of the children living there in 2015 were African American or Latino. Um, and really going through the records of this place, most had been admitted for very minor infractions, um, but were treated there essentially as criminals and, and lived in cells. And so you can see this cartoon from the Hartford Current um, where one person says, what a lovely facade. What do they train juveniles for? And the woman responds, prison. Um, because again, the, the, this, uh, this system was really not rehabilitated and did not offer any mental health services really for, ch for children. And although um, this center finally shut down after 20 years of uh, bad press and promises from uh, Connecticut, uh, Connecticut governors to shut it down, many, many, many others still exist. And sadly concluded one group of mental health professionals, quote, the juvenile justice system has become the only alternative for many poor and minority youth with psychiatric disorders, end quote. But as I noted, it's a system built on a correctional model without the capacity to treat serious mental illness. And so while we as historians of medicine like to opine about the changing nature of medical diagnosis, I think this story really starkly illustrates the real influence that how we name diseases, the terms we use, diagnostic frameworks actually play an enormous role in how we create health policy, how people get treatment, how we define what counts as an illness. Is delinquency a mental illness or is it, a, is it merely criminal behavior? And, that, and the fact that these frameworks, these words, these concepts impact the daily experience, particularly of vulnerable, of vulnerable groups. To be a black child in the 1950s or 1960s and break the law meant that you had a reasonable chance of being defined as emotionally disturbed and approached with a rehabilitative eye although you were still less likely to be approached that way than a white child. In 2019, a boy like Claude Brown is more likely to be intimately involved with the juvenile justice system from a very early age. And while I certainly don't argue that all criminal behavior em emerges from mental illness, the two have consistently intersected over the last century in ways that have disproportionately affected minority children. And so I think really in conclusion, it's critically that, that we be mindful of how the categories we use impact our most vulnerable citizens. Thanks so much. Awesome, thank you so much. That was um, really fascinating and we will open up for questions now. You can feel free to drop them in the chat or use the raise hand function and I'll unmute you. Um, but to start off, you mentioned this whole issue where all these different RTCs were saying that they were open to children of all different races, but it turns out that they didn't really have any. Was this because the courts were not assigning the children there or were they just rejecting them? So I think there are a number of reasons why. First of all, the fanciest centers like the Menninger in Topeka, those were private pay. And so the children likely to go to some of these centers were affluent white children whose parents brought them from across the country. Other centers like, um, for example, there was one just in Westchester and Westchester County, um, which still operates today, Hawthorne Cedar Knolls. The vast majority of children there were referred from juvenile courts. So they had a much more representative population. Um, it was not just all white. So part of it had to do with which uh, training, which uh, residential treatment centers we're talking about where they got their children from, whether they were funded um, you know, by the state or other philanthropic sources versus required parents to pay. Some of those things were, were factors. You know, interestingly, these were, you know, the generation of folks who worked in these centers, the psychiatrists, the social workers, there were really a, a 
very liberal, very progressive group of people. Um, and interestingly, they went out of their way to state over and over again, each of them in their admission criteria, that they would, we would be happy to take non-white children. And yet they didn't, right? And I can't read their minds, but I mean, the fact is that, you know, this is a pre-civil rights, pre-civil uh, rights act, right? Pre-1965 that uh, although the majority of these places were not in the South, it took quite a while until some of these centers started opening in the South. They were really focused in the Midwest and the Northeast at first. So you would have thought that they would have been a little more open-minded. It's hard to know how to read into that, but we know very well, right, that people can be very liberal and very open-minded, but the black kids weren't there. And that's you know what we can say as historians. Um, so we have a question from Tiffany asking, um, thanking you for the talk, but also asking, can you contextualize the case of 15-year-old Grace, the Black girl who was recently released from juvenile detention in Michigan, where she was being held after not doing her homework? Is this a common situation? Wow. Tiffany, I had not heard this story, and this is really devastating to hear. Um, what I can tell you is that I've heard a lot of similar stories. When I really dug into the Connecticut Juvenile Training School, which I mentioned at the end, um, you see many, many children who first come to attention for very minor infractions, running away, uh, you know, stealing a, you know, a pack of gum, um, you know, running from foster homes, really minor things. Then they're brought to these centers where they are treated like criminals. Um, and they live in cells, they have no windows, they are expected to work, um, and there is almost no uh, mental health uh, capacity there. They'll sometimes have one psychiatrist for hundreds of children, right? Um, and many of these children come into these centers with significant mental health histories, with, uh, with mood disorders, with uh, traumatic pasts, and then they receive no treatment there, and then they're treated like criminals. And it's not shocking that when children are released from these centers, they uh, go, you know, it, it continues to escalate and they're perceived as recalcitrant and they get fewer and fewer chances. So you'll find these kids who it's very, very sad. You know, some of them start to commit real crimes. Some of them just run out of chances um, and, and they end up imprisoned for the vast majority of their lives. Again, I'm not here to say that they didn't do anything wrong, um, but, but there certainly are cases like this where the first infraction is exceedingly minor, and then you sort of see a snowball effect after that. And, and it's really unfortunate, especially given this population that's vulnerable, often comes from impoverished backgrounds with few resources. Again, it's then put into a center with no mental health resources. Um, but I'm, I'm while Tiffany, while I'm devastated to hear that story, um, I can't say I'm super surprised. Um, and then we have a question from Nathan asking that defund the police is one of the marching chants that many of us are shouting now. How have policing budgets shifted over the years relative to mental health budgets? Because part of defunding the police means actually supporting the mental health services and the police don't actually want to be the mental health providers. Great question. So I think the first thing I need to do to answer your question, Nathan, is to think about how funding for mental health has changed over time. And the simple answer is that it has gone from pretty darn good to non-existent. And why is that? So first of all, who paid for these centers? I told you that they cost the equivalent of like $100,000 a year today. Um, in fact, they were paid for by huge philanthropies. They were paid for by state allocations. Um, community funds, which are now United Way funds, community treasures, actually uh, hugely supported these centers. Um, and so it's really fascinating to me the extent to which money was poured into the care of essentially children that nobody wanted, right? So these were the leftover children. Everybody had given up on them. And yet people were pouring thousands and thousands of dollars into their care. Same with uh, you know, child guidance clinics. So there was a lot of public funding um, for these institutions. And, and so what happened? Well, 
in some ways, the, the 70s and 80s happened. So really, first of all, there was a focus on community-based care. That didn't just come around in the 70s, 70s and 80s. That had been a top, that had really been a focus ever since the end of World War II, but had really shifted and become of greater focus in the 60s and 70s as institutions began really being seen as backward. Um, and so we wanted to treat everybody with mental health in the community, which is a great idea, but Unfortunately, the funds never materialized and we ended up with an enormous population of homeless mentally ill adults. So that transition, although it came from a good place, was never really executed well. And meanwhile, um, you know, the, the rise of, real, of conservative politics did contribute to changing in, in mental health funding. I can tell you, for example, specifically in California, in the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan slashed uh, the, the public funding for mental health enormously and, and many different uh, hospitals closed down. And, and he and his colleagues were, you know, in support of community-based care, but again, that community-based care was never really adequately funded. And so you see a huge decrease in government-funded uh, mental health care, and then really a growing feeling that, you know, who are these people? They're the bum on the street. Why do I need to help this person? Where I see, you know, what looking at the at the post-war era, a real sense of civic responsibility for this group of vulnerable people. And then, you know, moving toward what do I owe these people and are they really like me? Um, and so there's been a real distancing. Um, Yes, Nathan, I agree with you. Um, and so, you know, there's been a real, I think, distancing from a sense of public and civic responsibility for taking care of mentally ill adults and children. Um, and so as a result, we don't have those funds. And if you talk to people, again, I am not a psychiatrist. I'm very fortunate to work closely with many of them and talk to them about their experiences. And I can also tell you in my medical training, it's very, very difficult to find providers for children. There's a shortage of uh, child psychiatrists. A lot of people don't take insurance, unfortunately. They're just, the resources are not there. And so the police have by necessity, of necessity, adopted this role. Um, which I fully understand that they, they don't feel trained for um, and they don't feel is their job. And it wasn't always their job. Um, and so that has really drastically changed over time. Thank you. And we have a question from Bob asking, what would you like to see as an effective mental health care for young people now? He brings up the examples that a high percentage of mass shooters have had childhood trauma. Quite a number of children of wealthy families have pathology for example, Mary Trump's memoir about her uncle. Does this economic tsunami we're going through now provide an opportunity to fund more human intensive support strategies for youth mental health? So thank you, Bob. Your question um, is a number of questions and I'll do my best to address all of them the best way I can. So what I'll say is that I have written about the history of mass shooting. I wrote a piece in the Washington Post, if you just Google my name in Washington Post. And so it turns out that since the 1930s and 1940s, we have actually had mass shootings in this country since the late, uh, early 1890s. But it was starting in the 1930s and 1940s that media coverage of these events really started to focus on the mental health um, or mental illness um, of people who were committing these shootings. And you know, it, Columbine wasn't the first time that people saw one of these mass shootings happen and really called for reform in mental health. And unfortunately, these calls have continued after each uh, mass shooting, and a number of bills have just died in committee. And, you know, some things like George W. Bush tried to pass mental health parity. Uh, we are supposed to have mental health parity under the ACA. It's just not a reality. Um, the access to care is not there. Um, and so, um, sorry, I'm tr Nathan, I'm just scrolling up so I can uh, still look at Bob's question. I promise I'll get to yours. Um, and so unfortunately, these clarion calls in the setting of these national traumas have not resulted in major policy changes or increased uh, mental health funding, unfortunately. Does the economic tsunami we're now going through change things? You know, unfortunately, I, I think that mental health tends to come in last. If it should ever come in first, it would be after a Sandy Hook 
And again, those, and I, I also, again, I'm not addressing here the bigger picture of, of mass shootings. I just specifically want to talk about calls for mental health reform that follow these shootings. Even in the setting of a Columbine or Sandy Hook, meaningful mental health uh, legislation and increased funding has never materialized. So unfortunately, in a setting where our economy is in the doldrums and there's a rampant you know, unemployment and, and this disease is disproportionately affecting non-white and non-wealthy individuals, I think this is unfortunately the opposite of a setting where we want to pass legislation to focus on more vulnerable individuals. And I do think that, you know, that this pandemic will have long lasting mental health effects and we really just don't know, um, you know, what's going to happen now. I have spent the last several months taking care of patients with COVID and I can tell you that the clinicians will have trauma, the patients will have trauma, the families who have not been able to come see their dying family members will have trauma. Um, and so this would be a perfect time to, to really support mental health care and give more uh, funding to it. Not just, you know, it's, it's a question of, of multiple things, but insurance needs to cover it, right? Which it doesn't do a great job of. And we need to have clinicians who are available and have openings and take insurance. Uh, this is absolutely not bashing psychiatrists. Child psychiatrists are in shortage. There are just very few clinicians. Um, and there are many other clinicians who do therapy, social workers, psychologists, and so on. And uh, we just don't have the resources to give everyone the care we need, and we haven't decided how to pay for it. So I'm sorry that my name is Debbie and I'm being a Debbie Downer, but I am, I am not optimistic about that. Um, and the other thing I can say is that I just read the Mary Trump book and it was interesting. Okay. <laughs> Bob, did you want to weigh in a little bit on your question? I'm just going to say it feels to me like it's a timing issue. You're exactly right. Right now, politicians won't direct government funds towards any humane or even inhumane approach to mental health because you can't show concrete improvements within two or four years by the time it's time to elect. That's right. On the other hand, we may be 10 to 15 years from a giant downsizing in many services. For example, perhaps 80% of long distance truck drivers will lose their jobs between 2035 and 2040 because they'll be self-driving trucks until like the last six miles into the middle of downtown. And that's just okay. one example. So it feels- well, I also like think that right now with, you know, st individual states and communities hemorrhaging money from the, the pandemic, these services are unfortunately often the first to go. But maybe you teach in a medical school, so you have the professionalization of services. Could you imagine the churches, mosques, and synagogues activating a different approach? Yes. Or whatever. Anyway, I'm just sort of saying it's fascinating what you're saying, and you're right. The prognosis for maybe the next two to five years is not good, but I'm not sure it can't be good after that. You know, I'm, a, I'm an oncologist. By definition, I'm an optimist, okay? Uh, I really believe that. I really, I really am an optimist. And I think, you know, what you said about working in communities, I am very fortunate to work in a hospital that, um, that is, is firmly based in East Harlem and Central Harlem. And, and I've had the opportunity to go to churches and talk about cancer and answer questions. And I think that this is not, you know, this is not something that we just figured out. We have known for a long time that we don't just need white people to go talk to non-white people and tell them what to do. We need to engage with people in their community institutions and to support those institutions, not think that we can just come down from, from up above and then sort of dictate things. I think that's also a really critical element of change, that it needs to also occur at the, at the very local level. Um, I'm going to move to Nathan's question, if you don't mind. Um, even though, Bob, I could talk for a very long time about what you said. So um, Nathan said, how can we address systemic racism embedded in the mental health and special education classification system? Wow. How do we reconstruct our racially biased classification systems of young people? 
part of how we understand these people is about is about the money they have okay so you know part of it is that if if a white boy is being troublesome his parents can take him to a fancy psychiatrist if a, a child of color who does not have any insurance company coverage sorry and his his par he has a single mother who i'm just painting a completely stereotypical please pardon me because i am way oversimplifying society here but if we have somebody who has less uh you know medical um, exposure to the medical system, fewer resources, they can't access that same care, right? Um, and they may end up quickly being sort of sucked into the juvenile justice system. So part of it is about access to care. Part of it is calling out this systemic racism. And, and also to address some of what uh, I was just saying in the previous response, we need less of, you know, people who look like me deciding what happens to people who don't look like me. And we really need to, again, we know that African-American physicians are hugely underrepresented. We know that they can't even assist on a plane without being called into question. Um, and so we need to really support and lift up our non-white colleagues in the mental health professions because they have a really important role to play. And we really need to, again, engage with communities where they're at. I'm not saying that a black psychiatrist is obligated to fix things for their community, not at all. Um, and that would be oversimplistic. I'm just saying that I think it's important, again, to engage with um, to engage with members of the community, with community institutions, and to really lift up our colleagues who are are extremely qualified and often overlooked. I don't. I wish I had a better answer to that. I think that there's a lot of discussion of, you know, anti-racism training and learning about unconscious bias. I think that we should all be doing more reading. Um, I think that we should all do a lot of listening right now. I have tried especially in the, you know, I've been very grateful. Part of my history training is that I've done a lot of reading and thinking and writing about race with people, uh, with, uh, you know, reading things from non-white scholars. It's been helpful, but again, at this particular moment, I think it's just really critical to do a lot of listening um, and, and to not pretend that as a white woman, I can decide how we're going to, to fix the racist mental health system, but to try to listen and learn a little bit more about what's going on and, and go from there. Um, Tiffany, you said since the deinstitutionalization of psychiatric patient care, has there been any meaningful push to revive these services, at least in the medical community, if not in politics? So I'll tell you, all of the centers I talked about still exist. Actually, all of the centers I talk about in my book still exist. Um, and there are there certainly are residential treatment centers. There are some really awful for-profit ones where abuse is rampant. There are horrible sort of scared straight camps where they take kids on um, near-death experiences in the wilderness that pretend to trace their roots to residential treatment that are not. But non-community options exist because there are always going to be some children who need care in a non-community setting even if for a brief period of time. I think that we as a society and that, and that the mental health community is understandably and appropriately really hoping to continue to give care in the child's community as much as possible, in the setting of a child's family as much as possible, not wanting to do what people called in the 50s a parentectomy, to surgically remove the parents from the situation, but to really try to treat the child in situ but I think there will always be a need for, for children who need a time away from that environment, who need more intensive treatment. Um, I will say that insurance doesn't want to pay for a child to go stay at a nice place for several months. Um, and that's actually been a major transformative um, issue in the history of child mental health care because third party insurance we think of it as part of our daily uh, daily reality was really not a part of uh was of medical care until the 1970s and 1980s and once managed care came around and third party insurance came around they realized that they didn't really want to spend you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to have kids stay 
uh, you know, in these nice settings for prolonged periods of time. And we really moved to this model of crisis hospitalization where children are hospitalized if they're, for example, for example, imminently suicidal or deemed to be of imminent danger to others. And once that's passed, we then send them out into the community where they usually have great difficulty accessing services. I was really fortunate to be um, a member of the inpatient child psych unit during my history training. I got to att attend weekly rounds with children. And it was very challenging to hear the psychiatrist struggle with how they were going to deal with the child once they left in a few days, because they could only do so much in a week or two. Um, but at home, there were sexually abusive family members, or there was no money, or uh, there were not enough supports for the child at school with a learning disorder, or all of the above. Um, and it was really, really, it's really, really a challenging situation. So now we're sort of just in this crisis moment where children can only be seen when they're in crisis, and then they again go through the revolving door. Um, Bob, is there any data relating to whether young people who have aunts, uncles, grandparents nearby tend to work through their mental health challenges better than those who are more distant from them? Um, I can't answer that exact question, but I can tell you there is very good evidence that having support, family support, social support from friends, people nearby you is absolutely protective against mental illness. We know that to be a fact. I think that actually makes things even harder these days with our, our COVIDified world. So, sorry. Again, I'm ending on a downer, but I apologize. Um, no, I mean, those are the facts of the day. So that's great information uh, to have. Questions. Thank you for these wonderful questions. And thank you for really engaging with my work. I'm really honored. Um, so did you have any closing remarks for us about what we should be doing? <sighs> wow. I don't actually know that I've ever been asked that. <laughs> I thank you, Bob. I hope I meet you one day. You're very nice. Um, so you know, I think that reading about these things and realizing, um, you know, when you read about children who do bad things, ask yourself what kinds of assumptions are you making about them. You know, do you assume that they, uh, you know, do you? When you see, I, I will say we all have these biases, right? I have to watch my biases when I interact with patients because racial biases are a part of how our brains work in this society. But think closely about, you know, when you read about a black kid doing something bad, step back for a second and think about, what would you think about that story if it were a white kid who, you know, was attending uh, Andover, you know, and how might his story have been different? Um, from, from the child you're reading about. So I think thinking about the past is somehow a, a less threatening way to think about the present. And I think trying to not take things uh, just at face value, but to, especially when you read popular press, to really take a moment and, and think about the assumptions you're making. And I highly recommend anything by Rachel Aviv. I think she's a very sensitive mental health writer in The New Yorker. Um, and her pieces always make me think twice. Awesome. And you can Thank also, you. if you really want to learn more, feel free to buy my book. My parents will be happy. <laughs> yes, I have sent out links to bookshop.org, which is a great way to support oh, local good. bookshops. Wonderful. Um, and please do pick up a copy I of Dr. Dorsha's book. Um, but thank you so much for this talk. It was so fascinating. And I really like the idea of thinking more about when we read articles or how we refer to things and how that does make us think about different mental issues. Well, I am so honored to have gotten to speak here. Don't worry, I like Yale more than Harvard, except for the game day. It's only one day a year. So. so thank you all so much for coming. I hope you all enjoyed the talk. Um, we have a lot more events coming up, so be sure to check out the online calendar. But until then, stay safe and stay connected, and we'll see you next time.